Okay. Thanks. So I'll hand it off to you, David. Thank you, Peter. Great to be here. Um, I'm a long, long way away from here. I'm, I, um, living in, I'm living in Peru. So thank you for the invite, Peter. And um, web performance is one of my passions. So I love to talk about this topic. Let me share my screen. And I think the best way to introduce myself is with a few photos. So I live in, in Peru, in the mountains of Peru. And what you can see a mountain behind us, that's a massive, slightly active volcano. Um, we often have tremors in our city, so the volcano always lets us know that it's there. I live here with my wife and we've got three kids. And I work for a Christian mission organization and we've got a few Drupal sites. I also mentor students in technology. And at the moment, um, the plan is to train one person um, from, from scratch, learning the very basic HTML right up to looking after our group of sites. I um, would love to visit New York soon. This photo, photo is BC, the four children, who my wife and, and kids had a chance to, to visit. Um, we haven't been to New Jersey City, but hope, um, hope the next time we're there to, to do that. And this was just a magical moment on the top of the entire Empire State Building. I think if I had to name a couple of moments in my life where I really lived, um, I think the view from, from, from here was just breathtaking. Cool, so why um, web performance? If amazon.com was, oh, I forgot to mention my, my boat. So if I had a boat and I was gonna sail around the world, I think I would call it chill. Chill because um, most of my holidays are rushing around and it would be good to have a constant reminder that I'm here to chill. Cool, so why web performance? If amazon.com was just one second slower, it's been estimated that it would cost them 1.6 billion in lost revenue every year. So this doesn't apply just to e-commerce sites. Uh, a site like the BBC, very content focused, they did some testing and they found that after three seconds, for every second slower after that, 10% of users left. So you can calculate that if uh, their site took six seconds to load, they're losing a lot of users. And just to define a few terms, um, I'm focusing on performance versus rather than scalability. So often uh, a talk on, on, for example, server performance, is more focused on, on, on scalability. So I'm gonna focus more on performance, which is measured in seconds, while scalability is measured in requests for minute. So they're both important. Um, I'm also gonna focus on front end rather than back end. And the reason for that is, oh, let me go back one. We're gonna look um, a little bit more at web page test. And this is a, is a fantastic tool that helps us see where the bottlenecks are in the performance of a website. So if we look at this particular chart here, um, this first little arrow shows how much time it takes from when a person clicks to open a website to when the first byte arrives at your computer. So that is the server side, how long the server takes to respond. And we, we give that the, the term time to first byte. This, the, the arrow below that shows the time it takes for the page to actually open in, on your site. That blue line there is the, the line where the page is fully loaded. So it's 2.7 seconds for the page to actually render on your, your mobile or on your, your desktop versus 0 0.2 seconds on the server. So if you wanna make the biggest difference to performance, on the front end is where you can make the biggest difference. So looking at that again, the back end performance difference is, is less than 10% of the front end, the time it takes to render the web page on your, on, your, on your device. And I always like taking a real site and seeing how we can improve that. So 
I have chosen for today, a site that hopefully um, most of you have seen. And this is a fantastic example. It's, it's a Drupal site that's been really well built. And I just out of curiosity, I ran this website versus the other Ivy School websites. And it was great to see, um, based on the speed index, which is Google's measure of how far, uh, an overall measure of how fast the page loads, um, the Princeton site came number one. So this, this is constantly changing because depending on what images are on that home page, um, that can change. Um, but I think, do we have, how many people here do we have who have actually worked on this site? And I, I think I, I spotted two people in the, in the introductions. Um, at, I don't think we have people from web development services here. Uh, okay. John Cloys is here who's worked on the Woodrow Wilson School site, I know, and who came in late, so we missed him in the intros. We'll have to come back to him. Um, but yeah, we do have a couple of people sometimes join that would have worked on the site, but yeah, I don't think they're here. Okay, uh, no problem. Yeah. It's just a great example of a site that's been well built. So just to give you an idea of the plan for today, um, let me start my stopwatch to make sure that I don't run over. Um, we're going to look at metrics, um, how we can measure the performance of the site, um, look at what's good, what can be improved, and always focusing on where we can make the biggest gains because performance is, a, is an area that you can spend um, hours and hours. We want to make spend the shortest amount of time to make the biggest performance gains. So in, we'll look at images, optimizing images, JavaScript, and very briefly at CSS. So the, the, the main tool we're going to look at is called Web Page Test. And um, let me open that for you. So I'm guessing um, quite a few of you have seen this tool before. It's a great tool. It's free. It was first developed at AOL a long time ago. And recently, it's been bought by a, a company called um, Catchpoint. So I've, I've, this, it takes a few minutes to run this. To say, so, so to save time, this is what I've done. I ran this a bit earlier today. Right. So these are, are the, the results for um, the Princeton site. So let me switch back to the summary. Always great to see lots of green. So the first element is the, the Lighthouse performance score. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different scores with performance and different organizations have tried to bring everything together into just one, one score. And Google have done that with the Lighthouse performance score. I'd love to be able to go in um, to how this has been, been, been measured, how we can optimize that. But that's for another talk. That, that is a whole world in itself. Um, but let's have a look at the other, the, the other scores that we have. Um, we can see we've got basically A's for everything. There's one thing that we can improve here, um, which is cache static content. Um, I might also mention that this tick here is for using a CDN, and this site uses the Cloudflare CDN. So let's have a look, not just at things that have um, been done really well, but um, are there areas that this site can improve um, with just minimal effort? So I'll click on cache static content. Here there are a bunch of web assets where the the age has been set to just a few minutes, um, which means that if you hit that site again, um, say if you hit the site today, then you open the same site tomorrow, there's a lot of assets that, that are gonna be exactly the same yesterday and today. That makes sense that your browser just, um, rather than downloading them again, just uses the cached version. So ideally, um, if there are assets that aren't gonna to change too often, so for example, if I look for the logo, um, the logo here, the Princeton logo is not gonna change every three minutes. So it's something that you could say, expire this maybe once every year. And if you wanted to, to, to change this for the entire, um, for all the files in your server, you can either do, if it's Apache, you could change 
there are some changes you can make in your .hd file. Um, you can also do this on a global level if uh, this site's using um, Cloudflare. Um, this is setting in Cloudflare for the browser cache TTL, and you can set that um, to, for example, a year. And you don't have to worry um, with, uh, the only things that have been cached is if a file name changes, then it's gonna download a new copy anyway. So it's, it's only the same file name that, um, that are affected by this, this one year limit. So let's have a look again. What else can we improve with very little effort on, on this site? I like to look at content. This gives us a breakdown of what um, the different types of content that we're downloading from the website. Um, we can see here that in the number of requests, about half the requests are for images. More interesting is the, the bytes downloaded. Almost 80% of the website are images. So to make the biggest difference, we can look at the, the images. For example, the, the JavaScript is just 10% um, and the other elements are, are quite small. So we could spend hours trying to optimize the, 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 the CSS, for example, eliminating any unused CSS. But in our case, it's, it's gonna make very little difference. Cool. So let's open our summary and let's jump in to our waterfall view, which is a main view in, in web page text. And I know many of you have already seen this, but I will I'll give a very, very quick intro to web page test. Um, when you open a web page, it downloads the HTML and the HTML is like a to-do list. It says, get me these images, get me these JavaScript files, get me these CSS files. And so here are the results of what our to-do list for our browser um, has done. We download the HTML of the page first. And we can see here that it's taken 890 milliseconds. That's on the, uh, I've used a profile that's, that's a mobile on 3G. So it's a little bit different from the numbers that I showed you before. So this is, is loading the HTML. And then the, there are a lot of assets that are downloaded afterwards. So we've got CSS files, we've got JS files, and we've got lots of images. These here are, these WAF files are fonts. Um, we've also got some external files that are being downloaded, like New Relic, which is used for um, monitoring performance. And here's, and, and for example, here, a, a JS play. The first thing I noticed here, I'm always impressed with sites that have a small number of requests a lot of sites that haven't put a lot of effort into their into optimization have hundreds of requests, um, sometimes 200, 300 requests, and that, that is going to slow down a web page. Um, images are, uh, for example, on this site, 80% of the, the weight of the page is in the images. But one thing I'm really happy to see is that, um, let's have a look at the, the page first. We have a lot of, this is a very image heavy um, page. We have a lot of image, images, but only a small percentage, percentage of those images are actually loaded on, um, when we first load the page. So the, the best way to optimize an image is not loaded at all. Um, this website is using something called lazy loading, which means that when someone first opens this page, they really only need to see one image, which is this image here. So, so what lazy loading does is work, it works out when you, the page is loading, um, which images are the user needs to see immediately and which images can be loaded later. So what the Princeton site does is just load the most important pages. And I've checked the, the, the configuration of the lazy loading and it's set so that, um, it loads the images that are in the viewport and 800 pixels below that. So it means that when people scroll, 
um, they will never, they will almost never see images that still need to be loaded. Um, if you wanted to, if you were obsessed with performance and wanted to get the page load as fast as possible, um, you could be, you could reduce that limit, that offset, and say, I want to only load, for example, um, images that are 400 pixels below the, the, the current image. But it's always a trade-off because the, um, the more you try and optimize for performance, sometimes you can actually make the user experience worse. So yeah, so it's great that they're using um, lazy, lazy loading and there's a Drupal module for that. And I will show a link later on um, uh, where I've, I will link to all the modules that this site has used. Um, by the way, I have had no behind the scenes look at this website. Everything that I'm showing you is just information that's publicly available. Uh, I would have loved to be able to play with the dev version of this site, but um, it wasn't possible in this case. Um, so I'm not revealing any secrets about the Princeton site. This is um, the information that anyone can um, find from the site. Cool. So we've looked at uh, lazy loading. This site only loads the images that are um, needed immediately or soon to be needed. Um, we've got a, a, an A for image compression. If we were obsessed with performance, there are more things that we can do. So for example, I had a look at, this is the image from the homepage and it's 100K. Um, here's a tool called Squish, Squish app. Uh, it lets me look at, uh, I can, for example, increase the, the level of compression. And uh, I love this tool. This uses WebAssembly, so nothing needs to be uploaded to the server. Um, and it's, it's very fast. I can now run this and just compare the image. The left side of the image is the, the original image and the right side is compressed. And um, I can see what level of compression I can do. And so this saves me 33% of the image. Um, you would never want to force the content staff to manually have to download um, and optimize each image. So there's a Drupal module for that called Image Magic. Um, so automatically on the server, it will, um, when, once you save a file, it will compress the image. When I say compress the image, it's not changing the size of the image, but it's, um, it's making the image, uh, it's applying an algorithm to make the image smaller without too much loss of, of quality. Let's also have a look at the code behind an image here. You'll notice that we have this, this tag, the image tag has got this source set and it's not just got one image here, it's got a whole bunch of images. So it says 640, so if the width is 640 or less, it will load this image. If the size of the, of the, the device is, is greater than is 960 or less, it will use this image. So there's a lot of information in this HTML page um, and behind the scenes on the server, for every single image that you can see here, there's actually five other images stored on the server, depending on the size of, of, your, um, of your device. So if I'm on my phone, it is gonna download a much smaller image than if I was viewing this site on a 4K monitor. So that's, um, that's a very simple way to ensure that you send an image that's appropriate for that device. To do this manually would be incredibly dif difficult. Fortunately, there's a Drupal module for that called responsive images that are uh, now part of Drupal, in Drupal 8, it's part of Core. It takes a little bit of work to set up. Once it's set up, it, it's done. It's a great module because um, we've got mobiles, tablets, desktops, extra large desktops. We've also got different densities. So if you've got, for example, uh, a retina screen, 
that's double the density. So if you want to create a, a separate image for say retina screens, um, this particular module will automate that process for you. So the Princeton site already has that, that enabled. We can't um, optimize that anymore. So I think with images, they happen to be the most, the, the, the most important part of the site. And Princeton have already done a great job. There's a few things that they, if they wanted to, they can take things to, um, to the next level. Also, uh, there's a module at the, um, called Lazy Loading that I mentioned earlier. In Drupal 9, this is part of Drupal 9 core. So it's not something you need, you need to, to think about if you're using um, Drupal 9. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to, to answer questions as I go. Another thing I mentioned, there's a very small number of requests coming from, from the server. So often on a website, um, you might see 10, 20 different JS files. Drupal core does a good job of reducing the number of files that are uh, downloaded. There's also a module that a lot of sites use called advanced um, JS and CSS aggregation. And it's very likely that, um, that Princeton is using that site, given that we have just two CSS file, main CSS files and two main JavaScript files. So on, on this report, we have a link here to image analysis. So this lets you have a look at each image in, on the site and how, how much that can be optimized. So for example, um, we can see here um, with this particular image that we, uh, if we apply a different method of compressing the image, we might be able to, to compress that image more. Um, so going back to our slides, this is where the, the, the module Image Magic can, can help us because any kind of uh, manual process where people have to um, compress images themselves is ultimately gonna, gonna fail. I've spent hours optimizing the site and then one of our content people has have uploaded like a, a two megabyte image that have changed the statistics completely. So it's really important to, um, if you want to, if performance is important long-term, automating as much as, as possible. Cool, so I, I think we've done as much as we need to with images. Does anyone have any questions with, with image op optimization? Uh, quick question on the lazy loading. So is that, can you just describe how the lazy loading works? Is that something in the HTML spec or that's something done with JavaScript? It's now part of the HTML spec where, um, because so many sites were doing lazy loading, it's been added to the HTML spec. So in the, in the image source, um, in the image tag, you can now add, uh, I'll have to check what the, the actual um, attribute is, but it's up, I think it's lazy. Um, you can add that tag. And that means that, for example, if an image is here, it won't load till you've actually scrolled that, that scrolled into your viewport. Um, but that is, is very recent. That's, that's been only available this year. And it's only available as far as I know in Drupal 9. So to have that in Drupal um, 7, for example, um, there's some JavaScript that, that's added. So what the JavaScript, is, um, what the JavaScript does is it, um, once it detects you scrolling your, your viewport, your viewport scroll that the image scrolls into your viewport and then triggers the image to actually load. I hope I've explained that. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, looking at the actual page source, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing they're using an older technique or maybe one that's compatible with old, older browsers. Because, yeah, uh, so, so, what this site uses is a module called Lazy. Yeah. And what, what that does is when a page is first loading, the source tag is empty or points to a very tiny image. 
So when the page first loads, the images don't load, apart from maybe the, the, the hero image. Um, and then JavaScript looks for all the images that have a certain class called, called lazy. And then it, uh, it moves um, the, the location of the file into, that so into the, the source of the image. Mm. So when you inspect the source, it looks like it's all there, but when the page first loads, it, those source tags are empty. Mm. Okay, thanks. Okay. Cool, so are any other questions? And oh, um, image lazy loading has, has been something that makes a huge, huge difference to sites. You could imagine with, I did an experiment before um, where I looked at the page size if lazy loading wasn't, implement, wasn't implemented. And on this particular page, um, this page is roughly two megabytes. And without lazy loading, it would be 2.8 megabytes, which is a significant change in the, in the page weight. Cool. I was also curious, um, what else could I recommend for this? So images are, are, are well done and there's a few tweaks we can make. Um, I have a slide where um, here are the, the modules that we could use to optimize image magic, could be used to optimize um, the images. Um, lazy loading has already been done, responsive images has already been done, um, advanced aggregation has already been done. So what is something that could actually make a difference? What could I, rec I recommend for this site? I noticed when scrolling to the site, and you might want to do this later, um, there are points where the screen just stops. That's called jank. So let me, uh, you might not be able to see this on my, my screen because of, the, because of the way Zoom works. But there's definitely a uh, point where the screen just um, jams. And I was curious to investigate why that happens. And I played with the screen a little bit. The biggest pause is when that banner changes from the large banner, which we have at the start, to the smaller banner that we have when we scroll down a little bit more. Uh, but anywhere on I, I scroll on the page, there is a lot of JavaScript that's running that is not being revealed in this initial, uh, in the initial page load. So what, let us try, let's try and work out wh where that, that problem is happening. So if I open up um, Chrome DevTools under performance, I can hit Command Shift E or Control Shift E. And here, the page is loading. And once the page loads, I'm just going to just scroll. And I'll stop this. So that's going to take a few seconds, uh, maybe a minute, to do its thing. So I have actually done that already. look at performance. Now this is a really scary looking screen and I'm sure I don't know half the things on the screen but there is a lot of really useful information that you can get out of this. So this has just recorded what's happening as I loaded the page and then scroll the page. So I'll open the, the, the network tab first. Um, you can see that after the page is loaded, um, it, it's loading, for example, logo and different images. So this is the, the lazy loading. Now, what's really interesting is the JavaScript that's, that's running on the page. So let me center this. There's a lot of JavaScript that's running on the page. And what this chart shows us is, so a function is called, so for example, here, it's evaluating a script. A function is called, let me make this a bit larger. A function is called, and that, that function then calls other functions. 
and those functions call other functions. So if you see something going really deep, you have got a lot of code calling other functions and calling other functions. And sometimes you, you have recursion that makes these massive, uh, you, have, you have a lot of JavaScript that's running. And what I immediately noticed with this, this site is if you look at frames, red is not good. Red means that you, the Chrome browser just can't keep up drawing the frames. Um, JavaScript is a single threaded language and um, so much is happening in the script that the browser can't keep up. And that was the, the jerky screen movement that I, I was seeing. Um, but why, um, why is there so much JavaScript running? So if we, if I scroll out a little bit, there's lots of different chunks of JavaScript that's running, but let me just focus on the biggest task. So when is red, when we see this red, it means that the task took too long. Um, it's ideal with Jav JavaScript running in the browser that you don't have a task that takes too long. If you have lots of short, short tasks, it's better because it means that you let the, the JavaScript um, just-in-time compiler um, do your task and then do, um, say, browser painting. So if you're scrolling um, or do another task and then come back to your, your script. There are some scripts that take so much time that they actually block the browser from doing its normal job. And so we've got a few different tasks that are doing that. And let's delve into one of them. This looks like the biggest one. So let's dive in here. I can see foundation here. And I know this site uses, uses a CSS framework called foundation. And so this code is part of the foundation code. So let me click on, on that. If I click on, on this section, it looks through all the code that comes under here. Um, bottom up shows me which code takes the longest time to run. And so I could look at the call tree where it starts at the top and I drill down with each function that opens, but it's helpful sometimes just look at the bottom up, which are the functions that actually take the most amount of time. So let me open up um, layout first. So there's a function called get height by row that's taking a lot of time. I will now look at the call tree and see where that, that falls in the, in the execution. So functions are called functions that should call functions. It's not so obvious. Um, so that function is called deeper down. So what I'm going to do is I'll go back to layer. Let me click that again. I can see here which file that's, um, that's that function is found in. Uh, ideally, I would do this on the dev version of the site where the JavaScript and the CSS aren't uh, compressed into one into one file, but I, I can still jump in um, directly here. So here's that function. And on the left-hand side, I can see how long um, each of these take. Now, let me see how I'm going with time. Oh, I um, should be wrapping up soon. Um, this particular- don't, don't worry, we're not time constrained, so yeah. Okay. This, this is great. <laughs> cool. So this particular line takes uh, a, takes a, a, a disproportionate amount of, of time. Um, and that, that is because we are actually changing the DOM, the, the document ob object mod model. Um, there's lots of steps, things in JavaScript that, that are going to run blazingly fast. So things like assigning variables, um, doing loops. But as soon as we change something in the document object model, which is the, the internal representation of your, your web page, um, that is going to take a lot of time. So we can see that that's happening inside a loop. Um, we're setting a style saying height is, is, is automatic. 
not knowing enough about um, this foundation framework. Um, what I think, I, I believe this might be an older version of foundation where, um, and now with CS, we have something called Flex and, and Flexbox, which allows you to do a lot of things with CSS that used to be done with JavaScript. So I think it might be one of these, um, something like this, where if a newer version of the same framework might have a, a more efficient way of doing this. Another thing that I, I know to look at are scroll events because I was what caused the, the, the jerky movement was the, the scrolling. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna search for scroll. And here we are getting the scroll position. And there's quite a few positions, quite a few places in the code where we're getting the position of the scroll. And so I just out of curiosity, I downloaded the web page uh, and added some console.logs in the code to see how often the scroll event, these scroll events were being called. And let me see if I can grab that. And let me open up that. It's just a, it's a copy of the, the website where I, I could change change the code. And let me load this. So it looks basically just like the uh, the real the real web page. Um, some of the images might be missing, but that's um, that doesn't matter. So let me. So here's our. Um, here's I'm inspecting this particular page and having. I've added some console that logs. So let me just do a little bit of scrolling. You can see just with this, a, a tiny little bit of scrolling, hundreds of these scroll events are being triggered. So you can understand if someone scrolls quickly, thousands of times this code has been triggered. Um, so this often is fine, um, unless you're changing DOM elements as you scroll. As soon as you start doing that, that will affect the page and you'll see this, this jerky movement. And so there, there are some things that you could do to optimize this. There are two functions, two things you can do in JavaScript. One of them is called throttle and the other is called debounce. Um, so throttle, they're both ways where um, if an event is being triggered hundreds, thousands of times, you reduce the, the number of times that particular event is being triggered. And um, so for example, as I scroll, if, if this runs, this event is triggered a thousand times, we only maybe need to call um, the event 10 times. Cool. So we've looked at a couple of, uh, let me open my slides again. How, how would you implement a throttle like that? Okay. So, in, in this particular case, I wouldn't recommend implementing throttle because you're using a foundation library and it's something like hacking core where if you change their code, then you're kind of responsible for, it's very difficult to get updates from, from foundation. So I think the first thing I would do is check if the new version of foundation has, uh, has implemented this in a better way. But to, to use throttle, let me give you an example of a different website. So this, oh, uh, I should actually open it in the incognito window. Um, so this is a, a site with, with my organization where a lot of the users are very old phones. So it was important that we didn't have too much JavaScript running. Um, so when we scroll here, you'll notice that this doesn't appear till I actually stop scrolling. So there might be a thousand um, scroll events, but only when I stop scrolling does that bar change. So that's called debounce. So debounce works by saying um, when the events stop running, then trigger the event. While throttle says, uh, every, for example, every 15 milliseconds trigger that event. And to do that in code is, is fairly straightforward. Um, 
there's a jQuery, for example, has debounce, and um, Drupal uses the debounce function and throttle function a lot. So it's already part of um, jQuery. So it means it's changing the code where instead of calling a particular function, so for example, in our code, the problem was a function called, I think something like get height. It might take a second over. So wrapping, instead of calling that get height function every time, we put the throttle function, we pass it as a callback function to the throttle. And so we'll only get calls say every 50, with, um, uh, with throttle every 50 milliseconds or every 100 milliseconds. So I hope that's answered the, the question. Yeah, so, so for that you kind of like, um, well, I mean, I can sort of imagine how it would look in code, but yeah, I'd want to see an example. And I think um, there was a question in the chat. It seemed like someone was curious if you had to do something, you know, special to download the content of that site, or did you just kind of hit save on in your web browser and then and then pay, take the resulting files and put them somewhere? Uh, I use a tool called Web Scraper. Okay, uh, it's an npm tool. I, I have often tried using just Chrome's file save as, and the results have been very mixed. On some sites it works, and other sites it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But this web scraper seems to work very consistently. The, it only breaks down where uh, it uses a certain viewport. And so sometimes in, with a clever site like Princeton, where different viewports have got different size, sized images, sometimes it doesn't work on the screen that I've got open. But it, I think I can, I can post a link to that, that package if, if someone's interested. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, and let me very quick, I think I've run over time, but let me quickly run through. Um, so these are the modules that I've used. Um, if you're interested, I, I will um, send the, the slides to Peter, who can post them. Uh, I, I once tested someone's site and I measured the difference that different modules made. And so you can see um, comparatively which modules will make, give you the biggest bang for your buck. Um, there's some extra group of modules that I didn't have time to show that uh, are very interesting. Avif is a really interesting one because uh, it's an image compression that is better than anything the world has ever seen. Like WP has, 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 has been a bit disappointing, but AVIF will actually give you the same quality image for almost half the size. Um, that is something to watch for the future. If you're obsessed with performance, there are tools like unused CSS that will cut, that will look a spider through your site and then work out which CSS you can remove only if you get really desperate for, for performance. In Cloudflare, if you want to cache absolutely everything, the, the standard settings for Cloudflare, you don't ever um, cache your HTML. Um, so your HTML loads normal, and it's the assets like CSS, JavaScript that get um, cached in, in Cloudflare. If you want to um, cache absolutely everything, then you can use, there is a, a setting called in page rules, and there's also a module in Drupal to help you purge the cache for that, that site. I have actually um, set this setting, forgotten about it, and then been tearing my hair out. You can see I've lost a lot of hair, um, wondering why this homepage is not uploading, but it's been Cloudflare, it's been caching everything. Um, oh, another, I have to mention this is, this is a, a module that I've developed. Um, Go faster web. If if you really want your site to load faster than a React site would, would work, um, on this particular site, using this module, what it does is it it collects analytics of your site, and it works out which pages your users are most likely likely to click on. So on this site, for example. Um, it says that the slash recursos page, 55%, there's a 55% chance that people will click on that page. So it prefetches 
that page. So when I click on that, um, it, the prefetch is held in memory and then it does a page difference between the current page and the target page. So um, faster than React, that page, that page opens instantly. So in this new page, again, it's worked out where users are likely to go. And so for example, here it's worked out that I'm likely to click on either audio visuals or, or, or this link, and those links open instantly. And that's the faster web module. Because it uses JavaScript to do these page differences, um, it breaks sites that have a lot of complex JavaScript, especially ones that don't use the Drupal behaviors, which is kind of the standard Drupal way of doing um, doing JavaScript. Cool. So in Drupal, there's a huge number of things that you can do to improve the performance. You, the challenge I had with that particular site is making that, I had a, a React app embedded to do some of the searching. The challenge was for me was to make that, um, make that in Drupal and make it faster than it was in React. And um, the, I have got the statistics to show that <laughs> you're interested. So performance should never be a, a reason to migrate away from Drupal. So we've had a look at metrics um, for the least amount of effort, what's the most impact we can have. We looked at images, JavaScript, very, very briefly. In, in about half a second, we looked at JavaScript. So thank you very much. Um, the Princeton.edu site has been well built. The server performance is great. Um, the time to first buy it. There are very few requests. The images are optimized uh, and it uses a CDN well. Things that you could improve, case, case study content. You could, if you really wanted to improve the Im image compression, the JS scroll event is something I, I definitely want to look at. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was excellent. Yeah, that was really excellent. Thank you. Um, so it looks maybe we have questions. Ian, you have a question? Yeah, I thought I saw something recently that Google had changed their page performance metrics very, very recently. Does that affect any of this conversation, this presentation? Um, yes, um, but I didn't, I avoided talking about that. So in, in web page test, there is the Google's Lighthouse score that gives you a score between um, zero and 100. Mm -hmm. And Google are always changing their algorithm. And so I've previously done talks on how to get to 100, but I can't get to 100 anymore. So <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> I can't talk about that again. Okay. Uh, well, they're constantly changing their algorithm because they're, they're working out what is the best user experience. So whenever you make something measurable, people try to game the system. I shouldn't say game the system. They focus very much on the test and having a result that's perfect for the test, but may not be perfect for humans. And so there's a, a risk with any type of measurement where you focus more on the, the test than making it a good user use experience. So for example, with lazy loading, you could um, configure that so you load as few images as possible, but that might affect the user experience. So Google is trying to balance that by constantly changing to make it as human-centered as, as, as possible. Thank you. Interesting, yeah. And um, you mentioned back at the beginning um, with caching static assets was one of the things you thought maybe they could improve. Um, and I know it's odd to me that like the JavaScript and CSS that was aggregated wasn't set to cache longer because the file names do change, right? Or should change if any of the content changes, at least yeah. if I remember, if depending if the aggregation is done right. Um, then I think beyond file names, I think there's a bunch of places where Drupal or other web applications use query strings, right? So it's not, it's not just the file name itself, but you can actually just use a change a query string if you need to force the file to refresh, is that right? Yes. Okay. So uh, I think you can very safely set a far forward expiration date without risking. Um, it's, it's a low risk option. Right. Yeah, especially if you have, have, have a mechanism like changing a query string or something for 
yeah all your images yeah and with cloudflare you you can go aggressive and say ignore the, the query stream but mm. i can't see why you want to do that right yeah okay that was fabulous uh do we have any other questions related to that talk oh i've got a, a question here oh yeah uh, oh actually i'm just looking at the, the chat so ever noticed performance issues with Pattern Lab and Drupal. I, I'm sorry, but I didn't know what Pattern Lab. Can you, can Tom tell me about Pattern Lab? It's, I know it's like I, a pattern. And I might also the next question, which is, have you found that choosing a host, uh, hosting has an impact on page load speed? Yeah, I think which host you go through go through makes a difference in what type of server but the server only makes a, a, a tiny difference compared to the front end so um i think who whatever host you go through that needs to be more um what's more important is reliability good service rather than performance but i, I would maybe throw a caveat in there that some hosts have kind of automated integration with a cdn so if you don't have any expertise on that, you might choose, you know, hosting a service that integrates with the CDN, so you get that out of the box and don't have to manage it yourself. But yeah, that's yeah, I, I'd agree with that. So a service like Pantheon Acquia make a lot of things easier by bunching, um, automatically configuring things for you. Oh, um, Patent Lab, I might have to read up more on that. So Tom, feel free to connect with me. I'll leave my email address in the chat. And so feel free to connect with me. I don't mean to take too much time, but I'd love to connect with you if you're interested in, in performance. It's kind of not just my job, but also my, my hobby, so. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, well, thank you very much for joining us. I mean, you're welcome to obviously stay and participate in the rest of the discussion. I'm gonna